Hi guys, welcome to Cryptids Canada. I hope everybody's having a great day. So I apologize for not putting a video up last night. I have been busy trying to put together an hour-long video for you guys. I've been meaning to do it for a long time. So finally I've done it. So let's just cut out the jibber-jabber and get right to the video. Episode 2 Back in the early 80s, I was dating my high school sweetheart. We were in grade 12 and looking forward to graduating. Now, looking back, we actually believed we were going to get married and have kids. We spent every moment together. If we weren't at school, we were at his house or mine. We lived just outside of Lumbee, B.C. And if we went anywhere, it was with our parents. And it was usually to go to Vernon or Kelowna for groceries, or once in a while, the movies. Anywhere you looked was lush greenery. Woods, forests were the norm. It was not unusual to look out our front window and see a herd of deer grazing in our yard. Or to look at the side of the road and see a black bear racing alongside of you. Jeff got his license and could finally drive the car his dad had fixed up for him. It didn't take long for him to come and pick me up and cruising we went. We decided to go to Cherryville because we didn't go that way too often along Highway 6. We pulled off onto a dirt road and then onto another dirt road, which finally ended in an open spot that was right beside the Shoe Swap River. There were logs that circled a fire pit, and you could see that it hadn't been used in a long time. So we decided to enjoy the view of the river as it rushed by. We had a clear view of the other side and watched as a doe and fawn came to drink. We were there sitting in the car listening to the radio for quite some time when we realized it had gotten really dark out. The windows may have been a little steamed up as well, wink wink. I can't remember which of us saw the eye shine first, but we were mesmerized by it. We talked about not seeing any trees directly in front of us across the river. We recalled the clear view of the doe and the fawn, so we knew the eye shine was not coming from up in a tree. Whatever it was had to somehow be suspended in the air, because we figured it was close to ten feet off the ground. The ice shine was like two amber light bulbs the size of giant marbles that we used to call lunkers. We were captivated by this ice shine. Every now and then, whatever it was would blink, getting a rise out of us. Then we heard some kind of squawking, for lack of better descriptions. I became very aware that our windows were halfway down, so I whispered that we should put our windows up slowly. So we did. I'm not sure, but I believe that whatever it was was a sign to them because all of a sudden, that being that was all the way across the river was now in front of the car. It literally jumped across the river. It was still dark, but we could at least see the very tall, hair covered man. We knew right away it was a Sasquatch. Jeff said, F this, and started the car and turned on the lights. And that is when all hell broke loose. It pounded both fists on the hood and screamed bloody murder, actually hurting our ears. Then we felt another attack from the back. Now we were screaming and pleading with them to please stop. Later, we both agreed that we were sure we were going to die. So we felt like trying anything was better than nothing. So Jeff hammered on the horn, which made the beast cover its ears and scream even louder. Jeff moved the car forward while still holding the horn down. When we couldn't move forward any longer, we started to reverse. We were surprised that nothing stopped us, so Jeff just crammed his foot down as hard as he could, and we backed up until we were at the road. The Bigfoot was standing by the river. We had let the horn go, and it was no longer holding its ears or roaring. It actually looked like it had an evil grin on its face, as if it was going to get even with us for blowing the horn. 
Once we got the car in drive and started quickly down the dirt road, we felt like we were safe and out of the woods. We were amazed and astounded that we had just really experienced a Bigfoot, a bad experience with a Bigfoot. But relief was the key word because we actually survived when we thought we were going to die. I asked Jeff to slow down a little because I was scared we were going to crash. But unfortunately, that was a bad move because I just happened to glance out the passenger side window. No more than two feet from my face, a Bigfoot was running right beside the car while leaning down, staring in at me. I screamed for Jeff to speed up as an enormous hand shot out and slapped the passenger window. I can still hear the popping sound as the millions of shards flew into my face and lap. That was where our memories stopped. It was like we fell asleep and woke up when we pulled into my driveway. We have no memory of all the drive home. That is almost a blessing to both of us. Sadly, Jeff and I broke up after that. The memory of what happened to us was too great for Jeff to bear. I saw him a few years ago. He mouthed the words, I can't, and he turned and walked away from me. I knew what he meant, that he couldn't relive that night. I'm not much better than him. These things are real, and they're capable of some unimaginable things. Our biggest mistake is not taking them seriously. I have used fake names. Thank you for letting me vent. And there's no signature. On to the next story. Hello. I was an only child and lived with my mom. We weren't rich, but we weren't starving either. My mom had some health issues that prevented her from wanting to spend any time in the wilderness. So luckily, I was always invited to go camping with my best friend, Kathy, her parents, and baby brother. We always went a couple of times a year and always went to Moraine Lake in Jasper National Park. Kathy and I were both 12 years old when all this happened. Kathy's parents' names were Chris and Tina, and they had a four-month-old baby boy named Stephen. He was a pretty good baby and didn't cry too much which was why we felt it was okay to take him camping. That spring, we had planned to go for a week, if all went well with baby Stephen. We always went a week in the spring and then a week in late August. The year before, they bought Kathy and I our own tent because they felt we were old enough. They kept Stephen in with them. So, that year, they were on one side of the campsite and us girls were on the other side. The reasoning was that Stephen would sometimes wake up at night for a feeding, and we certainly didn't mind the extra freedom. As usual, we were having a great time. Chris loved taking us fishing in his small aluminum boat he always brought with us. Tina was staying in camp with baby Stephen, except when we were hiking. She would put the baby on her back in a carrier. First two days were fantastic. But it was during our fishing trip on the third day that we heard something weird. We were fishing just off a shore from our campsite when we heard Stephen cry because he was hungry. Then we heard a huffing sound from the shore, and when we looked to see what it was, all we could see is the trees and underbrush swaying. Chris started panicking and got us back to shore as fast as he could. He had heard that there was a grizzly sighting about five miles away, but he said he wasn't taking any chances. Chris told us to stay in the boat, then gave us a push back out, just a little ways. He ran to the car and got the bear spray, then started making tons of noise. Tina wasn't too happy, but understood. I happened to glance to the spot that we had seen the trees moving and heard the huffing sound and I swore I saw a black face and head towering over the trees, looking right at me. I tried to catch Kathy's attention, but finally, when she looked over, the head was gone. She said I was in that job. I couldn't stop seeing that head looking at me. I was really nervous for the rest of the day and really panicking by night. I tried to talk to the adults, but they were doing their own thing. 
So that night we went to bed and I think I finally fell asleep. I woke up to the sound of Stephen fussing. Then, once Tina got him settled, I tried to go back to sleep, but I started hearing whispering or very quiet chattering. It was a language I had never heard before. Then I started hearing owls hooting from the same place. I heard the chattering and then an owl on the other side of the campsite by Chris and Tina's tent as well. Somehow I fell back to sleep just to be woken by someone feeling the nylon tent. I could hear very heavy breathing. I was terrified. Then Kathy started screaming holy terror. She kept yelling over and over, it grabbed my head, it grabbed my head. Then Chris opened the tent door and asked what was going on. Both Kathy and I were crying. But the funny thing was, he took Kathy and let her sleep in his tent with them. But it was my own fault because I said I was okay, but I wasn't. I knew that something had grabbed Kathy's head. So I waited about five minutes. Then I snuck out of the tent and I crawled into the back seat of the car. I locked all the doors and tried to hide on the floor. I wasn't in the car five minutes when I felt the car rock a little. I lifted my head just in time to see a dark shape walk past the opposite side of the car from where I was hiding. I lifted my head and I peeked through the small opening under the headrest. I could see a huge body sneaking around between the tents where it was the darkest. Then it stood straight up and walked past the fire pit over to the tree where our food was hung. I clearly saw it from behind and it looked like it had hair all over its body. It reached up and pulled down the cooler and the duffel bag with the food in it. It started walking back towards the car, so I crouched back down behind the seat. I knew when it walked by because I heard the cooler scrape the car. Back then, the coolers were mostly made out of metal. I decided right then and there I was going to go home in the morning. I would pretend to be sick and have my mum come to pick me up if I had to. When I got up the next day, I saw that Chris and Tina were already up feeding Stephen. I climbed out of the car and they looked at me with strange looks on their faces. They asked why I was in the car and I started to cry as I explained everything, from when we heard the woofing in the bushes to the food being taken the night before. Tina said she knew she heard something walking around the night before, and when Chris said it must have been a bear that took the food, then Tina said she didn't think a bear could reach 10 to 11 feet up for a duffel bag hanging from a branch. They asked me what I thought it was, and all I could say is that it looked like a really tall man with hair all over it. They didn't doubt me at all. We decided to pack up and go home early. Kathy was shocked to hear everything and felt validated that something had grabbed her head. On the way home, Kathy said she guessed that they wouldn't be camping anymore, and Chris just said, we'll see. I honestly wished I had never seen that thing, because the last thing I ever wanted to do was see one of those things ever again. It was a source of nightmares and anxiety, even to this day. Kathy ended up inviting someone else camping that August, and by the time school started, I was the crazy liar who ruined their whole family's camping trip. I was humiliated and was picked on because of it. Then one month ago, I ran into Kathy. I hadn't seen her in years. Now we are both grandmothers. She told me she was sorry about what happened, that it was actually her father, Chris, who told her friend about it when they went camping in August. I just told her it didn't matter to me anymore. Then I walked away. In a way, it was satisfying walking away while her mouth was wide open. There was no friendship there, nor would there ever be again. But the crazy thing was, that night I was poking around on YouTube when I came across your trailer. I was blown away by the whole thing. I love when your videos come out. I've been playing with the thought of sending you my story. So today, I finally sat down and typed it out. 
I will say I had a hard time remembering and writing certain parts, but I actually got through it. Thanks for listening. Okay, let's move on to story number three, which is episode number 32, Bigfoot Ruined Our Honeymoon. Okay, dear cryptids Canada, when my husband Bill and I got married, decided to do a week's honeymoon in the great Canadian wilderness. Our friends had stayed at this cabin slash resort on Lake Nipissing, and they gave it great reviews. So we called and asked if we could book a little early in the season. Our seasons typically begin in late May, so we needed the place for the first week in May. We were prepared for snow or nice spring weather, but we did specifically ask for a very secluded cabin if that was available. We were told that they were more than happy to work with us. It took us about four hours to drive just north of Toronto to the lake. There was light flurries as we arrived at the park. It was a peaceful enough place, but the cabin seemed closer than we expected. We were also quite surprised that they gave us a cabin right next to the office. We explained that we were under the impression that the cabins were very secluded, and this was not the case. The cabins were like 20 feet from their neighbors. We asked if we could please have the cabin beside the woods, and that we wanted to be on our own. They tried to make every excuse. Their first excuse was that the cabin was not spring-cleaned. Then it was the owner may have other plans for it. Finally, they reluctantly relented. So we went down to the last cottage and it was perfect. It was nearly surrounded by the woods and the lake was about 15 feet away. Now, please understand that I'm not throwing shade on mentally ill people or people with serious learning disabilities, but this is a big part of the story, so I have to add it. When we were checking in, there was a young man in his late teens or early 20s who kept popping in and out of the office. The lady at the desk kept telling him to go home. I think he had a little crush on me because he kept staring and grinning from ear to ear. Of course, I was polite to him as well. I thought he was adorable. So by the time we finished in the office and got directions on where to go, the young man was at our cabin offering to help with our luggage. We kept saying no, that we could do it, but he grabbed a suitcase and started down the path to the cabin. Bill and I sort of giggled behind our hands. The young man told us his name was Billy, and we laughed and I said that was my husband's name too. Well, that was it. Billy was on Bill like white on rice. He was hugging my husband and saying that they were brothers and best friends. We just laughed and went along with it. A minute or two later, there was a knock at the door. I opened it, and it was another woman from the office, and she said, Billy, come on, let's get home now. Billy lowered his gaze, waved, and ran out the door. She apologized and turned to leave. Then Bill said, There's no need to apologize. That Billy was a nice young man who meant no harm. Well, you would think that we had just thrown a bunch of poop at her because she turned around and sneered that he didn't need any encouragement from people who don't even know him. Then she closed the door a little harder than she needed to. We just stared at each other a little bit stunned. Then we let out a laugh. We couldn't believe how rude she was over nothing, really. But we weren't going to let that ruin our time. By the time we got our stuff unpacked, it started to snow heavily. But that was okay because we brought our cross-country skis and snowshoes. So we just hunkered down inside a while and let it snow. We kept busy with some more indoor activities. Then we had a nap. Afterwards, I got up to make some dinner and I heard Bill yell from the bedroom, Hey, get the heck out of here! So I went into the room and Bill was at the window. He said he thought he saw Billy looking in the window. Bill looked deep in thought over dinner. When I asked what was wrong, he said he didn't like that someone was looking in the window. I said, well, not to worry about it. It was just harmless Billy, and Bill just stared at me. The next morning, we got up, and it was gorgeous out. 
we decided to pack a lunch and go snowshoeing into the woods. We were in awe at how beautiful the scenery was. We had been gone for two hours and decided to stop for lunch. We looked around for a broken log to sit on, and that didn't take long. We had a thermos of coffee and sandwiches, and as we sat and talked, kept getting a whiff of a very bad odor. Both of us were sniffing the air and noticed that it was coming from the area that we had just come from. The same area that we were going to be heading back through on our way back. Before we were finished our lunch, I stood to stretch and I swore I saw something or someone peeking around a tree at us. And when he saw me looking, he went back behind the tree. I thought it was Billy, so I just gave a quick wave. I mentioned to Bill that Billy was spying on us again. He said that he was getting annoyed by it. I reminded Bill of his words the previous day about Billy being no trouble at all. Bill had smirked and said, let's head out. So as we were snowshoeing back the same way, we started hearing loud bangs on the trees to the left of us and then to the right. We stopped and listened, and then it stopped. We couldn't see very far into the bush off the trail. I asked if it could be a woodpecker, and Bill said, woodpeckers don't do just one peck that they had a mission to actually make a hole in the tree. So we shrugged and headed down the trail, the whole time smelling that awful smell. When we got to the clearing and our cabin was in sight, we heard this loud whoop, whoop. It started out low and got louder and louder as it went. It was also done in a high-pitched voice as well. Then it started all over again. That was creepy. We agreed it was the sound that Billy might be able to do, but we didn't think he could do it for that loud or for that long, as it went on for a long time. Once again, we just shrugged. We decided to go out for a nice romantic dinner at a place we saw on our way to the lake. We were nearly the only people in the restaurant. We actually felt bad because it felt like we were keeping them open. But they assured us that it was a family business and they opened for the locals because there was nowhere else for someone to go and get a burger and fries or a nice meal, such as ourselves. So our waitress asked where we were staying, and we told her we were on our honeymoon and wanted to experience the wilderness. She made a comment as she walked away that we should be careful because we might experience more than we bargained for. Then we heard someone in the back speak to her, in a foreign language, and a rough tone. We were stunned because she sounded like she was in trouble. So when she brought our meal, we asked her quietly what she meant by that, and did she get into trouble? She laughed quietly and said no, she wasn't in trouble. It was just her dad's loud tone, that's all. We enjoyed our meal immensely, but we noticed the waitress wasn't hanging around us at all like she had been. We even called her over and asked if everything was okay. And she said, oh yeah, sure, everything is fine. But the explanation was overkill and we could tell that there was way more that she wanted to say. We left a big tip as a peace offering and we left. We had talked about having a nice bonfire when we got back and we were excited about it. Bill was gathering some kindling and I was making our Caesars. I could see the fire from the kitchen window, and I carried out our drinks. We were cuddling on a log made for two, and it was a gorgeous night, but maybe a little too cool, so Bill offered to get us a blanket. While he was inside, I swear I heard a low growl, but it was more like a grrr, where a normal growl would be a grrr. (laughs) I know that sounds stupid, but there was definitely a difference. It was quiet and deep, and it came from the wood line that was about 20 feet away. I immediately looked to my right and scanned the woods. I didn't see anything. I yelled to Bill when I heard the door open to grab a flashlight from the drawer in the kitchen. I told him what I heard, and he scanned the wood line and said he didn't see anything and that it was just probably all right. 
After about ten minutes of talking quietly and sipping our drinks, we heard it again. I asked Bill if he heard it, and he quietly said yes as he reached for the flashlight. He waited a minute and then scanned the woods with a crappy flashlight. What we saw freaked us out. We saw a red eye shine about a foot off the ground. No big deal, but the eyes were huge like the size of ping pong balls, and they were really far apart, and they looked forward like humans, not like a deer or a fox. When the light swung past them, the eyes closed. Bill whispered, did I see that? And I said, yes. Then he kept scanning down the wood line, and we could still see those eyes open again, and they stared at us. Bill swung the light back to the eyes, and they shut again. That's when Bill said, that's it, let's go. That's giving me the creeps. When we got inside, we shut off all the lights and went to the side windows to peek out the curtains. The eye shine was gone. So all night, we kept sneaking back to the window. Then Bill said, holy crap, come here. The same two eyes could be seen way up in the tree. Every now and again, they would slowly blink like an owl. But even the biggest owl we could have ever seen had eyes half the size of these eyes. We went back to watching TV for another half an hour. Then we turned off the TV to go back to bed. We were woken up by a big bang on the wall directly behind our heads. We both sat up and said, What the heck? Bill got up and looked out. There was nothing there. Then the rock started hitting the roof. That went on almost all night long. We now knew, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that it wasn't Billy trying to be funny. But we decided to ask one of the staff members if they knew what was going on in the morning. We decided to do a little fishing from a paddle boat that they said we could use. So we were getting our gear on the dock when we saw a few girls with cleaning supplies heading to a cabin by ours. They were doing the spring cleaning because we were the only guests. So we walked over to them and we asked if they were the owners. One girl said her grandparents owned the place. So I asked her what was going on with the spying and the noises and then the assault on the cabin last night. She looked shocked and very nervous, claimed not to know anything. I felt she was lying, but what could we do? They went into the cabin, and we walked back to the dock. Bill said he could see her looking out the window towards us, and then as soon as we were in the paddle boat, she came out of the cabin and ran towards the office. We were getting weirded out by people's behavior for sure, but we were really enjoying ourselves. It was so peaceful on the lake not even a ripple in front of us. So we stopped paddling and threw our lines in. We were using bobbins, so we were quietly watching our lines with the giant splash came up from right beside the boat. We were rocking back and forth violently. Bill happened to look on shore, and he said he clearly saw a huge hair-covered man turn and walk behind a big tree. He said, that it's the last straw, we're getting out of here. So we paddled to the dock, and as we were getting our gear out, an older woman walked over to us and asked if we were having a good time. Bill said this was the most amazing place to spend our honeymoon, but he's very angry that there's something going on, and we just nearly capsized because it threw a small boulder at us. She knew right away that we all knew what it was. She played dumb and offered a refund of our money, and we took the refund and left within the hour. Bill told me he had a weird feeling from the first night. He said he got a good look at the person looking in the window that first night, and it definitely wasn't Billy. But he didn't want to worry me. We agreed not to mention this to anyone because people would think we were insane. This happened in 1974. I had forgotten the name of the resort years ago, but I do know that others have had sightings around that neck of the woods. 
I sure don't have any desire to see them or experience them again. Bill and I never spoke to anyone about this until now. Signed, Bill and Lorraine. Okay, this is the fourth video, episode number 36. It was titled, A Female Bigfoot Befriends a Lonely Little Girl. Hi, Leslie, Cryptids Canada. This is very hard for me to do because it dredges up some very bad memories for me. But it also reminds me that I got away and made a life for myself. And if my story helps someone else, then okay. It's okay to feel a little discomfort. I grew up in a little house in the woods outside a little town called Ridoso, New Mexico. Please forgive me if I've mispronounced that. My mom homeschooled me until my little brother was born. I never had any people friends. The time frame I'm referring to was back in the mid-60s. We lived in a tiny two-bedroom house with indoor plumbing, so I guess it wasn't as bad as some had it. I remember my parents fighting all the time. My dad liked to sneak out and get bottles. The drunker he got, the meaner he got. When I tell my kids and grandchildren what my life was like, they say it sounds like the story of a young Jenny from Forrest Gump. And yes, I could agree to that. My dad worked at a few different jobs. He tried his best to provide, I guess, but when he drank, the feeling of comfort was gone. My poor mom had inherited the house and car from her parents, who had passed away very close to one another the year that I was born. My parents moved from the small apartment in a basement to the house that was my grandparents' house. Mom always said that Dad resented her for some reason, maybe because everything they had was technically hers. I was about five or six when Dad was laid off again, so Mom got a job working as a waitress in a restaurant in town. Mom used to get Dad to drive her to work until he forgot to pick her up, so she started driving the car herself. Dad was always mad because she took the car. He would call one of his friends to come pick him up to take him to town to the liquor store. This is when he would leave me home by myself. I don't recall being too afraid. I would just watch TV. This is around the first time that I had my experience. Mom and Dad were fighting all morning because Mom had to go to work. So she left and as usual, Dad got picked up. He was really drunk when his friend dropped him off. I was terrified because I saw him peeing all over himself. I just hid in my room. I remember him calling me as he stumbled down the hall. I had a sense, I'm sure, and I hid under my bed. He checked my room for me and called me names as he stumbled out. When he went to the living room, I snuck out the back door and ran to the woods. I was not afraid in the woods because that was where I played. That was where I was comfortable. At some point, I fell asleep. I felt very cold, but I was too afraid of my father to go back in. Now, this is where things get foggy. I remember being so cold and shivering, but I remember waking up and feeling so cozy and warm. I know I will probably be called a liar, so I will admit from the start that I'm really not sure if this really happened. Maybe it was a dream. But from my heart, I don't think it was. I woke up several times and I felt like I was being cuddled, like a mother would cuddle a newborn. I could smell a strong, musky odor, but it wasn't offensive. Then I was soothed back to sleep. The next thing I remember was hearing my mom calling for me. I woke up and looked around because I felt that something had kept me warm and now it was gone. I stumbled and walked towards my mom's voice. Within a minute or two, I was in the house. She hugged me and cried that she was sorry. Then she asked me why I smelled so bad. My mother and I have discussed this many times. I do not actually remember her asking me anything. She filled in those details when we talked about this experience. 
She also remembers I was as warm to the touch and wondering why I wasn't half frozen. It was after that when Mama told me she was having a baby. I still had my room to myself, so my brother wasn't born yet. When I started having nightly visits at my window, the weather was getting warmer at night, and I was keeping my window open. This is when my friend would come and whistle at me and make soft cooing noises at me. I knew she loved me, and I was sad when she went away. I really don't have a lot of feelings about my father except fear, but most of the time, he went to work like any other dad, I'm told. He would get really drunk once or twice a week, and then all hell would break loose. When my brother was born, Mom was really preoccupied, so I was allowed to go outside by myself a lot, and I remember visiting with my friend in the woods. She never tried to take me. I do remember she was way bigger than my dad. My dad was 6'2". This went on until I was about nine because my brother was two and a half to three when mom finally packed us up and we left dad for good. I never went back to that house. Dad came and saw us a couple of times, but when I was about 12, he died from drinking too much. All of this came to light when I was approximately 16 when I was sleeping at a friend's house and we saw the Patterson-Gimlin film on a news clip and I was so sure she was my friend. Okay, here goes the waterworks. Ah, I was so excited to see her and stupidly I told my friend and her parents that I knew her, Patty, and they told me I was ridiculous and that was nothing but a man in a costume. My friend's parents were very religious and after that, I was deemed a liar, and she wasn't allowed to speak to me. I explained it all to my mom, and after that, she remembered a lot. She remembered the night that I slept in the woods, and the time I spoke to her about my Bigfoot friend. She also thought I had a make-believe friend. My mom was the only one to support me and back up my claims. That old house is long gone, and the property was sold but I often wonder about going back there just to see. She's probably long gone too because I'm now in my 50s. I believe things are sometimes meant to happen. She saved me from an abusive father and gave a lonely child a dear friend. I sometimes feel sad that I just up and left her. I wish I could have told her we were leaving and I hope she realizes that I loved her as much as she loved me. Signed, Belinda Martin. P.S. I love your channel. You seem like a sweet, kind-hearted lady. Please take care of yourself. Of course, now I'm going to have to go through a box of Kleenex. But on to the next story. Okay, this is story number five, episode number 37. Its title is, My First Friend Was a Sasquatch. Hi, Cryptids Canada. I have carried along my story in secret for 40 years now. I was listening when you read Belinda's story. It brought me back many good and bad feelings about my encounters as well. But like Belinda said, if it helps one person, then it's worth a little discomfort on the storyteller. Well, Belinda, consider me the one person you helped. I will also tell my story in hopes it helps someone else too. That's beautiful. So, I was born in Georgia, and when I was three years old or so, my mother walked in on my father, being unfaithful to her. My mother was a small, meek woman who was an excellent wife and mother. But she didn't speak up much for herself under normal circumstances. But I think seeing that pushed her over the edge. The next day, we took a taxi to the bus station and got on a bus for Montana. That's where my mother was born, and that's where my grandparents still had a farm. I love my grandma and papa. Papa let me follow him everywhere and took me to town to have coffee with his friends when we were supposed to be picking up chicken and pig feed. My mom was heartbroken at first, but started feeling better when she started going to visit old friends from high school. Eventually, she started dating an old friend from school. His name was Don, and he had his own farm. When she took me over to meet him, 
he started trying to butter me up by giving me my own horse, which I was way too small for. The farm was really big and there was a lot of hands working there. Don had the house renovated for Mom and put in a nice swing set for me. My mother married Don and it was okay. I didn't think Don liked me much because whenever I asked him to do stuff with me, he always got a farm hand to take me. One hand, who genuinely liked me, Big Nick. Big Nick would take me fishing at the creek at the back of the property. We would also go for walks in the woods and he taught me how to recognize animal signs. But after a year, he died of a heart attack. I was heartbroken because Nick treated me like I was the son he never had, and he would tell me as much. Don didn't seem to like any of the neighbors around the farm, because he said to avoid playing with any of the kids around here. School was starting to draw near, and at dinner he was constantly telling me to avoid the kids from around here. Later I would ask Mom, and she said she didn't really feel the same way as Don, and I could play with whoever I wanted, but not to tell Dawn. Then we swore to secrecy. After school, I took my fishing rod and my little tackle box that Nick gave me and went down to the creek. I saw a kid playing in the water on the other side where the woods were. I had never saw any kids around there, so I got very nervous. But I was excited at the same time. Maybe he was a native boy. So I went to my spot on the creek and just pretended to ignore him. I noticed he had started to toss pebbles at me. So I tossed a couple back. Then he scooped up a handful of water and tossed it my way. I started to laugh and he squealed then too. Pretty soon we were both in the water up to our knees, splashing cold water at each other. I could tell he was having as much fun as I was. Then I heard a loud growl and my new friend looked back into the woods. He turned back to me and splashed me again. Then he showed me he was having fun by showing his teeth and squealing loudly. I realized now he was probably copying me. I splashed him back, and the growl from the woods came much louder. He stopped and looked back again. I started to back up because I knew growling wasn't good. He ran up to me again and splashed me, then took off running for the woods. I was soaking wet and cold, so I decided to go home. I realized my new friend didn't have any clothes on, and he had tons of hair. But I didn't care. We sure did have fun. I went back the next days, and he wasn't there. I started to feel sad. Finally, I went to just go and fish, and he was there sitting in a few inches of water, playing with a stick. I ran into the water, and he looked up and did his awkward smile, with me starting to jump up and down while holding each other's arms. We heard a scream from the woods that sounded like a hawk flying overhead. He let go and lowered his head. I thought he looked sad. Then he scooped up water and dumped it on my head. Then we taught each other our names, standing right there in the creek. I touched my chest and said, Benny, over and over, as he tried to say it. Finally, he said, Bae. Then he said his name, Ieta. I hope I'm saying that right. When I said it, he jumped up and down. It was cold in the water, so we went to my side of the creek and sat there playing with rocks. I heard a noise and I looked across the creek and I saw what must have been Iata's mother. She was hairy like him and I could see her breasts. I was shocked that she was so tall and she had no clothes on either. She stared at us and I waved at her and I could see she had a confused look on her face. Then she did a low growl and Ieta looked at her and ignored her again so she stepped forward and growled again. He kept ignoring her, so I made the mistake of pushing him forward to go and listen to his mom, and she screamed and ran at me. I lowered my head, thought she was coming to hit me. She leaned down into my face so close I could feel and smell her rancid breath. 
Then she screamed so loud my ears rang for hours after. Then she grabbed Yetta and threw him over her shoulder by one arm. Within seconds she was in the woods and gone. I sat there stunned. The power that this mother had was terrifying. The ground literally shook as she ran towards us. I've heard on your channel someone describe the sound of a charging Bigfoot makes a similar sound to a charging bull elephant, and I would greatly agree. After a few minutes of sitting there, stunned, I ran home as fast as I could. I was scared to death. I ran through the door and went to my room. My mom followed me and asked me what was wrong. I was terrified to tell her, but I finally let it out. I told her what happened with my friend and how I thought his mom wanted to hit me. My mom was furious and called Dawn into the house. Dawn was there in a minute because mom never spoke harshly. I could hear her telling him that my friend's mom almost hit her son and she wanted to know who they were and that she was going to have a talk with her. Dawn came into my room and started questioning me. I was scared because I knew I would have to tell him that I had a friend from around here. When Don came into my room, I was surprised because he was very kind towards me. I cried and I said I was sorry that I misbehaved and played with a kid I wasn't supposed to. He looked confused. He asked me to describe this kid and his mother. Later he clarified that one of the neighbors had some boys that were a wild bunch and he didn't want me getting caught up with them. He looked terrified. He pulled my mom out of the room, and she started to cry. They came back into the room and told me that I could never go to the creek ever again by myself, that my friend had the ability to do great harm to me. Then Don left the house. A few minutes later, I saw him in four farm hands on horses with guns going towards the creek. Later, when he got back, I heard him tell Mom that they found the trail and it was definitely a Bigfoot. They shot their guns into the air and hopefully scared them back into the woods. For years, I thought about it and what happened. And then I realized, when I became a teenager, what my friend and his mother were. By then, I had a horse that I could ride and I would go into the woods and look for signs. I never found any, but... I felt kind of blessed that I wasn't killed that day. Now I understand why she reacted the way she did. She thought I was hurting her son. Don told me that he was born and raised on that farm, and when he was a boy, they had some trouble with a bunch of Bigfoot stealing chickens and whatnot. So a bunch of guys saddled up and went after them. He said they never had a problem again, and that's why he never thought to mention it to me. So that's my Bigfoot story. You can use my name. I am no longer in that state. Ben Chernichenko, I believe. Hopefully I said that right. Okay, on to video number five, episode 41. 11-year-old left to deal with nine-foot-tall Bigfoot. I remember doing this originally. Um... Yeah, this is a crazy story. I hope you enjoy it. Dear Cryptids Canada, I have written to several other very popular channels with my story, but I guess my story wasn't good enough for them to tell on their show. Maybe they don't believe me, but I believe you will. So I'm going to write it down one more time, LOL. I understand if you decide it's not good enough. I honestly believe that it shows that parents need to stop shutting out their kids and start listening. It's no wonder so many kids go missing every year. Every year we would pack up our station wagon. Yes, this took place in the early 70s. Then drove from our home in southern BC, hop on a ferry and go over to the island. Vancouver Island, to be exact, for those who don't live in Canada. This was an exciting time because we were going to visit my parents' lifelong friends, Bob and Sue, who were married and had kids roughly my age, Lynn and Lisa. Now, because they had a small house, they always pitched a tent in their backyard 
and their two daughters and I would sleep in the tent for the weekend. The parents had the house to do their partying in. I was not too excited for this particular time because memories of the last year started coming back to me. The parents had allowed their daughters to invite one friend each to sleep in the tent with us for the whole weekend. So there were five girls in a small two- or three-man tent. That year was the year those girls learned that being mean to the newcomer was a source of great fun. They made me sleep at the bottom of the tent at their feet, and a periodic kick would just liven up the party. I cried myself to sleep because I thought these girls were my friends, and I had been so excited to be seeing them. The morning after, as I was going into the house, they all surrounded me and told me that they were only playing and they were sorry. I was relieved and I didn't say anything. That night, I was treated even worse. I realized that they'd conned me with their insincere apologies so that I wouldn't tell on them. So needless to say, I wasn't too excited when my parents announced the year after that we were going in the morning to visit their friends. I tried to tell them what happened, but the last thing they wanted to hear was something that would ruin their fun weekend. So when they said we were going again, I put up a little stink that I wanted to stay home. But I couldn't be so lucky. I was only 11 that year, so I wasn't old enough to stay by myself. When we arrived the next afternoon, I saw the tent was already up, and the doom and gloom set in. I was standing in the kitchen with the four adults. Sue excused herself and left the room, and then Bob suggested that I go into the girls' room to say hi to his daughters. I held out a small amount of hope that maybe they would be okay, so I relented and walked towards their room. As I got close to the room, I heard the mother, Sue, saying that they had to just put up with me for a couple of hours, and then they could leave. I met Sue in the hallway, and she wouldn't even look at me. I snuck out of the house and I sat in the backyard by myself. Their backyard was filled with beautiful cedar trees and there were woods all around, but there were also houses as well. But this is the norm for B.C. and the island, or rather it was. I haven't been back in more than 20 years. After a long while, I heard Sue and my mom coming outside. I thought they were coming to look for me and that made me emotional. I heard the car doors all slam, and the car started. I turned to look, and my mother waved at me, and off they went. I went into the house to use the bathroom, and my dad and Bob were drinking at the table. They saw me, and Bob said, Oh, why are you still here? I just shrugged and asked, What do you mean? He said, All the girls just went shopping. Where were you? Maybe they thought you were sleeping in the tent, he suggested. I said no, they all saw me and even waved. My dad asked if my mom saw me and I said yes, and he shook his head. Needless to say, I felt very alone. Later, when mom and Sue came back, I went back outside to the tent. My mom came and asked what I was doing. She said they dropped Lynn and Lisa off at their friends for the weekend. I was very relieved to say the least until I asked if I was sleeping on the couch. Mom said, no, it's probably best for me to stay in the tent, that I would be just fine. At that moment, even as an 11-year-old, I knew my mother was as selfish as they came, and yes, the rest of my life pretty much followed suit. I think it's important for me to explain all this to you so that you could understand what I went through that weekend. All day, I pretty much stayed by myself. I was starting to hear noises that I wasn't familiar with. It almost felt like something was trying to get my attention. I would have tiny pebbles land in my lap, but there was nothing there when I looked. Then there was whistles, but not just plain whistles. They could make all kinds of bird sounds, but you could tell they weren't birds making the sounds. Like, try to imagine a person who is really good at whistling, 
and then they make bird sounds. Well, the fact that someone could whistle that good is what impressed me. And that's how I felt about this whistler, LOL. I really started thinking it was a really cute boy in the woods trying to catch my attention. LOL. I know, I was only 11 for crying out loud. Anyway, I was called in for dinner and I actually brought it up. All the adults laughed because they thought I made it up. But I actually remember Sue was nervous about this and asked more questions than the rest. That's kind of why I thought it was a kid. Maybe a friend of Lynn and Lisa's? So I was basically kicked out of the house after dinner, about 8 o'clock. I had a sleeping bag, my books, and a flashlight. It was probably about 9 or so when I crawled into my bag to go to sleep. Now, I had no way to tell the time exactly, but I assumed it wasn't much later than that when I woke up to a very bad smell in the air. I sat up, and my back must have leaned against the side of the tent, and I noticed it was something hard. I remember thinking that there was nothing around the tent, and then it moved. I remember I said, Very funny, Lisa and Lynn, thinking that they must have come back home. A short while later, I heard a conversation from the woods. I couldn't understand the language, but there was a lot of tweeting and twerping sounds and whistling with tongue pops. Even as an adult now, I have to search my mind for words to describe the sounds. Now, I know they weren't humans conversing. I do not believe a human could learn this language, or rather, they could maybe learn to understand it, but they could not speak it. I was fascinated by what I was hearing. Then I started hearing what I thought were pine cones and pebbles hitting the tent. I was still thinking that it was Lynn and Lisa. I had to use the bathroom, so I turned on my flashlight. I unzipped the door and went towards the driveway to go in the side door. But I found that door locked. I knocked and I knocked. I could see the glow of the TV, but all the lights were out. I turned the flashlight back on and made my way back to the tent. I knew I was going to have to pee outside, but I wasn't too bothered by that. I was just off to the side of the tent, on the side closest to the woods, and I was in the middle of peeing when I heard another whistling sound. I shined my flashlight into the woods, and something very big jumped back behind the trees. I was positive it was the adults pulling a prank on me to make me feel better, or so I thought. I smiled and I went back in the tent. I sat there holding in the giggles, waiting for them to do something else. I must have waited so long that I fell asleep. I awoke to a loud, raspy breathing coming from the right side of my tent. Then I could hear a sniffing, like how a dog sniffs when he's sniffing around. But it was much louder and much bigger sniffing durations. I could tell that it was right beside my tent, like right where I had peed earlier. I was convinced that it was my dad and Bob. I literally held a hand over my mouth to stop from laughing. I quietly snuck close to the side of the tent. I could feel them gently touching the tent while it made those sniffing sounds. All of a sudden, I lurched forward, smacking into them with both hands while screaming, Rawr! The reaction I got was the furthest thing from what I expected. This is so hard for me to explain. I heard it start to roar back at me, and then it hit me so hard that I believe I flew through the air as I screamed. I landed hard. I could still hear it roaring as it picked up the tent like a grocery bag with me laying in the bottom. I was screaming as loud as I could, and then I heard my mom and dad screaming for it to put her down. Then someone threw on the spotlight. The Bigfoot dropped me, and it screamed as it ran back into the woods. I heard my parents running to me and fighting over where the hell the zipper was. 
Finally, they pulled me out and helped me into the house. Miraculously, I only had a bad headache and a bruised side from where I landed when it hit me. Here's the kicker. Bob and Sue knew there was an apparent Bigfoot sighting in the area, but they said they weren't sure if they were truthful. My mom screamed, asking was it a coincidence that their kids went to stay at their friend's house instead of sleeping in a tent like they always did before. Sue screamed at my mom that her kids slept at their friend's house because they hated mom's little brat. That was it, basically. My mom packed the car as Bob apologized for Sue's behavior. Honestly, I didn't care. I was glad it was coming to an end. I was in shock. I really don't remember anything of the aftermath except what I was told later. Apparently, Sue admitted she heard rumors that there was Sasquatch or giant wild men seen in the area. So my mom accused her of keeping her daughter safe but endangering me. I do remember my mom saying as we walked out the door, she said something like, Karma's a bee, Sue. Your daughters have to live with monsters all around them, even in their own home. We ended up in a hotel that night because I didn't want to sleep in the car while we waited for the ferry the next morning. As far as I know, my parents never spoke to Bob or Sue again. I received a call from Lisa a few years ago as a part of a therapy program she was in. She said it always bothered her the way they treated me and that she was sorry. She admitted that they knew that Sasquatch was seen and heard in the area, which was probably behind their mother, asking if they could stay at their friend's for the weekend. Also, she asked me to pass on to my parents that Bob and Sue would love to hear from my parents. I just said, yep, thanks for calling. But before I hung up, she cut me off and asked if I forgave her. Now, maybe you're thinking badly of me or think I'm immature, but my final words to her were, hell no, I don't forgive you. I could have been killed. When I got older, it occurred to me to ask my parents what exactly they remembered from that night. They said they were all watching a movie when they heard me knocking. They were waiting for the commercial break because it was a really good movie. She said the name, but I can't remember it now, like that was a good excuse as to why they left me outside. Anyway, when I stopped knocking, they must have forgotten me until they heard this horrifying sound from the backyard. Bob and Sue ran to the back deck, and Mom and Dad went out the side door. They all saw the Bigfoot freaking out on the tent. They were all screaming for it to stop, and then someone turned on the floodlights, and that's when it stopped. My parents described it as the biggest man-like creature they ever saw. They said it was three times bigger than a man, about nine feet tall. It was covered in long, light brown hair, that stunk to high heavens. I eventually learned that my mother was the most selfish person I had ever met. She tried to persuade my dad to follow her in her selfish ways, but my dad always tried to make it up to me. Once he explained that he didn't agree with some of her ways, but he stayed because he loved her. I kept my distance from her, but dad and I stayed close till passing several years ago. I don't speak to my mother now. Thank you for taking the time to read this. If you don't think it's good enough, that's fine. I understand. But please don't use my last name. Signed, Suzanne. And yes, I am named after her. My goodness, that story was as good this time as it was the first time. Well, there you go, guys. You're always asking for longer videos. So I decided to pick some really old ones. Let me know if you like this. I'd have no problem redoing some of the old ones. Anyways, guys, you know I love you. I hope you enjoyed this. Let me know. Have a great evening and we'll see you back here in a day or two. Bye for now.